I live and breathe mastering every day. And along that journey, I've learned from some of the best mastering engineers in the world. We're gonna be sharing eight mastering skills I've learned from some of these talented engineers and show examples for each. So buckle up, don't forget to smash the subscribe button, like the video, because by the end, you'll actually have a set of skills for mastering you won't see elsewhere on YouTube. The first engineer I've learned a lot from was Martin Pullen. He's who I started interning for, assisting for. He's mastered for Deep Purple, Richie Blackmore, Guy Sebastian, John Farnham. If you're an Aussie, you know who John Farnham is and he's super talented at what he does. One of the first things I learned and that was critical in all albums we worked on, singles as well, was topping and tailing, which is basically the fade in, the fade out of the tracks, the spacing between them. And one of the lessons I remember really sternly was we were doing a piano album and the sustain pedal at the end. Because we were working with analog gear, we were capturing background, the analog take, and I stopped the take too early before the sustain pedal came off. And it was a classical piano recording, that was an absolute no-no. Um, I learned my lesson from there, always let the sustain pedal come off. I got an example here with this really cool sax outro, which is fading out, and then something happens. See if you can pick it up. See if you can hear what is going on here. Did you hear that? Somebody in the room, because this is a live take, is filming the live version, and they've they've clicked they've clicked a the photo, well, you know the, the the clicker on a Canon or a Nikon. Beep beep. So we need to make sure this fade does not include that beep beep. We need to fade it a little bit shorter, but make that fade sound natural. So the simple way to do this is first we need to identify exactly where that little click is happening. It's right in there. Let's make sure we get rid of it. Okay, now that's not how we want to end the track. We want to add a fade. If you're in Pro Tools, just highlight the end section, add an F or click F. Um, and then if we double click here, we can actually bring up this curve, which we can shape as we need. Now, typically when it's a long sustain fade with a few elements, um, and especially when you're cutting the fade short, like as in it's not its natural fade, I like to do an S curve that starts to taper off slowly and then at the end it's 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 a little bit less it's a little bit more gradual that taper at the bottom so have a listen to this fade and see if we think it sounds natural enough much better now i've seen you don't have to use the fade out as in the fade tool i've seen people do it also with the clip gain line so just adding a bunch of points and then bringing each of them like down to create their own shape, especially if there's like percussive elements, you can pop a few hits up instead of just having it um, be so linear. So you can actually work with some of the material. So if you've got a particular drum hit, you, you feel is getting lost a little bit, you can write that in. Both work, but it's a good skill I don't think any mastering engineers on YouTube are talking about, and they should be. The next engineer is Luca Predalesi, who's mastered for Skrillex, Drake, Diplo. Now, I've got a really extensive interview with him. One of the techniques from that I'll be sharing in this video as well. But the first thing I learned from Luca Predalesi was on his Pure Mix course, um, which is controlling the mid-range. So compressing the mid-range of the mix and allowing the low end and the top end to move freely. And this was especially so with dance music. Dance music where the low end has to thump, but the mid-range has to be forward and in your face. And the way we can set this up is in Pro MB. We're going to add three bands, a low, a mid, and a high. We're not really going to do anything all that much to the high. There are other things you can do to the, the high and the low. But for this example, I'm just going to focus on managing the mid-range. And the reason is because what we're going to do is we're going to just turn these ones off for now and focus on the mid-range and find the point where there's just the energy. So we don't have a lot of the thump from the kick or the snap or detail of the hi-hats and the snare. Let's have a listen. Oops, wrong track. Okay, so that's that energy. You've got the vocal sustain, you've got all the synths, you've got all the little textures from all the other elements. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on compressing this and then gaining it back up. So let's do this. Right, 
now take a listen to that mid-range with that whole mid-range compressed and up in your face as opposed to taking it out. Another skill I learned from Luca was from the interview, and it was how we consider or look at saturation. Saturation isn't just harmonics, period. It is also we can use as artificial EQ because those harmonics are in higher registers. It's artificial compression because it's actually making the information more dense. So not only does it have a unique texture or color to the image or the, or the signal it's processing, but it can also be used like an EQ, like a compressor, and here's him explaining this particular technique to add an extra layer to your kick drum in the top end. Oh yeah, the first come to mind is the top little kick uh, sparkle that I'm getting from distortion. And I encourage everyone that has a uh, diamond dynamic saturator to try that. So uh, a perfect example is this. So if I do uh, a filter and I do simply the 7K to 9K area or let's say the 6K to, to 9K area. But anyway, I do just like imagine a little top, I do linear phase, I saturate in a dynamic mode, density two, which is very snappy, and I do ex a expansion. Now what's happening, like based on the envelope of the kick, I'm adding a touch of saturation just on the top of the kick, almost creating an, an extra layer of kick drum just for the top ends. And I find this very effective. And this came, I don't wanna say by accident, but it was more like, okay, how we can just now that we have this as a plugin, we can just make this as a great, almost sound design tool. Let's have a listen to this off and on, and it just has a great sound to this particular track. I really like this technique and using this particular setting on the uh, diamond saturator. It's a testament to just good engineering and smart mastering technique. The next are Grammy winning engineers, Howie Weinberg and Will Borza. Will Borza is a good friend of mine. Back when in 2020, when I was in LA, he was co-mastering a record with me. So I went to go visit him at Howie's studio where he was assisting at. And fortunately for me, Howie invited me into the main room to listen to some stuff I'd worked on and he cranked the hell out of the speakers. I asked Will, you know, why was he cranking the speakers? He's like, that's how it works. That's how he works. He listens to stuff louder when it hits him right, it feels good. That's how he dials it into. And I'd never heard or been in a session where I was working that ridiculously loud in the cockpit. But then I started doing it in my own sessions. And this isn't something I can show you in a technique, but it's something I can talk to you about. And basically every now and then when you're working on your track, crank the shit out of the speakers, okay? And when you're listening to it, get a feeling for what is pushing you away. Is the sibilance getting really harsh? Is the snare cracking too loud? Is the low end just going all floppy and all over the place? Get a feel for it because you know when it's hitting right. When it's hitting right, you don't get any of those sort of bad sort of artifacts when you're cranking it loud. It just sounds good and punchy and nice. The caveat to that is just don't monitor loud all the time. It's just a quick little spot check. You're in the drop. Crank it loud. Is it feeling good? Is it not? What's not feeling good? And then adjust accordingly. The next lesson I learned from Will was actually, funnily enough, on that same visit. And I didn't take to this lesson straight away. He was basically telling me, because we're working on this, we're co-mastering this record together. Um, and he's gone to me, Nick, th this is what I've done on the settings. I I'm using the Pro L2 as a clipper. And I'm like, that's absurd. Pro L2 isn't a clipper. And he's like, no, it is. You've got to do these settings, blah, blah, blah. And I completely dismissed him, unfortunately. Until I started looking into the Prowl 2, and you see this in other subsequent videos, I'll leave the links in the description below, it is a really flexible clipper. It is a really good hard clip if you know how to set it up, and you can manage the clipping with the limiting together in the one plugin. I'll show you how that's done now. But basically, in either all-round or transparent mode, the attack time isn't 
attack time per se. It's actually a time gate for the clipping module. And then uh, once the transient exceeds the time set on the attack, the release mode enables, which is the limiting version. So you've got clipping control, so transient clipping, and then sustain or release sustain um, limiting. So what I'll show you is we'll put the release to zero, the attack to 10 millisecond, 10, 10 seconds, and we'll manage the clipping on this and then manage the limiting and you'll see the result. You'll hear the result. It's, it's, it's actually really cool to do. And then we'll AB it. attack time at about five milliseconds it's allowing those first five milliseconds of the transient to clip and then the release stage comes in which is the limiting stage now have a listen to this i've got a one-to-one -one, so when i bypass it's level matched and have a listen to this before and after And if you're curious about the overall loudness of this, let me turn that off. And this is, I put 8.6 decibels again to this. This is pretty damn loud. And that's only with just being able to know that this is doing the clipping and how much clipping to include, as opposed to how much limiting. That's an invaluable skill that I've always used with Prowl 2 since coming round to it. Even though Will told me about it, I was a bit stubborn at first to sort of take that advice or that advice on board. The next engineer is Ian Stewart of Flowtown Mastering, who collaborated with Tone Projects for Baselane Pro. Um, I've got a full interview with him as well. It's down in the description below. But there's one particular part of this plugin which I'm using often in mastering, and a lot of mastering engineers are really enjoying it too, and it's this stereo harmonic section. See... When we want to make something wider, sometimes you have to change the values of information between the left and the right channel. So you're changing what's already existing there, and then you alter the way that mono signal sounds, and that's not a good thing. This is very unique, because what it can do is you can take the mid-channel information and then saturate it to the stereo field. So the harmonics being produced from the mid only goes to the stereo field. So the mid stays the same. The mono signal stays just as strong. You just add this thickness and width to the overall track. Now... Let's monitor the side signal, okay, and I'll show you how I set this up. So what I'm doing is I'm aiming to find out where is the low end in the side signal, sort of lacking a bit, and then I add harmonics there from this mid signal. So have a listen. So everything below 200, there's not much low end there in the side signal, and you can argue that you don't really need it, but for the sake of the fact that this is just a bit of extra color, a little bit more pizzazz that you can get rid of late, like it gets rid of when you go to mono, who cares? It doesn't affect it too much, but it sounds great on a stereo. Have a listen to this. So I'll put the dampen to 200, go mid, crunch, and then I'll turn this off and then I'll turn it back on. Take a listen to this. This is, I, I enjoy this so much. Get a little bit of that kick there because we're still monitoring the side signal but it's probably a bit too much so we're going to just bring it down three decibels maybe 4.5 it's wrong way negative 
Okay, now let's monitor the stereo signal and take a listen to this before and after. Do you hear that just smacking? It just, the, the kick is just smacking the, the weight of it still in the middle, but you got all this harmonic texture out the side, especially on the snap on the transient that you get. Have another listen. Finally, the last engineer on the list is the only one I've never met, engaged, or had a conversation with, unfortunately, and that's Bob Katz, who wrote the book Mastering Audio. Um, the way he's described and talked about upward compression, the idea of bringing low-level information in the signal up rather than squashing the transient information down, um, is something is just is just a great skill and technique that every engineer has to know about. I've spoken about it quite a bit on this channel, actually. And funnily enough, the plugin I use to actually do this upward compression is developed by his former assistant, Robin Rumens, and this is as good as signal processing gets Leapwing. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to compress the signal in multiband and then blend it into the original. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to take parallel mode off for now. Okay, and then we're going to put parallel mode on, drag all these faders down, and then we're going to slowly blend that low-level information back into the mix. What that does is just brings out all the smaller details from underneath the mix back up into it by com it's basically parallel compression but upward compression is the terminology he uses and doing it all within this plugin is really powerful anyway those are a bunch of techniques and skills i've learned from some of the best in the industry they're really great engineers i'll leave actual links to all of their websites down below so you guys can check their work out you know stalk them Get them on board a project if, if you really want to work with them. That would be awesome because they're great, talented engineers. And until next time, take care.